Yeah, hello again, uh, for the last time <laughs> at least. Um, yeah, if you have seen um, uh, Ike's talk earlier today, um, you have seen that there's uh, probably a few things we need to look into and talk about regarding um, our libraries and our frameworks on Android. And this is what this is about. Um, why do we care about Android? Um, you can basically, um, for one, list all the, the arguments that uh, have been listed for KDE on Windows, right? It, it has a huge deployment base. It is a somewhat alien, somewhat hostile platform. Uh, but if you really want to reach end users, um, there's not really uh, a way around it. Um, and then another reason to look at it, uh, at it, Android is not only the um, this evil Google platform, but there is uh, uh, variants like Lineage OS that are basically Android without all the Google stuff. So that is probably the closest thing to a um, real-world usable mobile phone platform that is close to what we would like to see from a privacy point of view. Um, and then, of course, uh, longer term, looking towards Plasma Mobile, it's a nice proving ground that, is, that exists today in which we can do application development and test our frameworks for mobile readiness. Um, before we actually have, I mean, some of us do, but not all of us have actual working Plasma mobile phones. Um, and why do we need frameworks on, on Android? Um, well, we have stuff like Kirigami, as you saw earlier today from IKEA. That's a, a great tool to actually build touch-friendly um, mobile interfaces. Um, and another reason is uh, the platform abstraction APIs in Qt don't cover everything we need. Uh, one prominent example is notifications. Um, you don't really want to have platform-specific code for that in your application, right? That's why you use the frameworks for. And KDE frameworks have a bit broader API coverage there than Qt does. Um, and then thirdly, we have a lot of existing application code. Um, and it is much easier to reuse that and bring it to mobile if we can use the same frameworks. Um, so Android is basically Linux, right? So this should be easy. Um, no. Um, there is um, quite some restrictions that the Android runtime puts on us, like the, the very strict sandboxing and bundling of applications. Um, uh, and some additional um, restrictions due, uh, due to the how Qt on Android works. So the, the restriction to single process is actually mostly coming from Qt. Um, while all the sandboxing restrictions are coming from Android. So you can't just randomly access files in the system. Um, you can only see the stuff in your bundle. So there's also no IPC, no DBus, right? Well, there's, there's Android-specific IPC, but there's, no, there's not our IPC like DBus. Um, we can't just install platform stuff um, like we like to do on, on Linux. Um, the platform API we have to work with is in Java, um, which is fairly, I mean, it can be integrated with, with C++, but that is a fairly cumbersome process. Um, then, I mean, Qt widgets work there, but you don't really want them there. Um, and the window management is completely different, right? You basically work with full screen applications and the platform is very restrictive regarding how you can control what kind of window should be in the, in the front. So anything we have that makes assumptions about windowing or influencing the window management uh, is also not applicable there. So um, what is the current status regarding um, our frameworks? 
Um, so many of the functional tier one frameworks um, that don't really rely on platform specific stuff, um, they just work. Uh, so that's stuff like K archive, um, config, uh, holidays, uh, translations, codecs, that kind of stuff, right? Um, and then we have some that actually have platform specific code, or platform specific adaptions, like Kirigami that integrates with the system back button and, and that kind of stuff, or K notification, which has an actual Android notification backend. Um, so this is, those are basically good to go. Um, then we have some that, um, that would make sense because the, the feature is applicable to, to Android devices, but where we are um, either missing a backend implementation for that platform or where the current structure of that module pulls in dependencies that don't exist there or that uh, pull in architecture that doesn't exist or is not applicable to Android. Um, so the, the first set here, um, I specifically added the DNS one for, for Ike after this morning. Um, those basically, they map very well to existing concepts, but we need a backend implementation. Um, the second set, um, uh, especially KIO and um, uh, declarative, they need to be probably a bit more, there we need some more invasive changes and can maybe only support a subset of the features, like KIO installed some, some platform services um, that uh, uh, is likely not applicable to, to Android. Um, and then we have the, um, the second set. Um, there's a large amount of frameworks that are very uh, widget specific and that are more or less designed for large scale desktop application like XML GUI. Um, most of them actually compile fine and well, kind of work in, to the extent they can work. Uh, and those are actually useful um, uh, to have. You don't want to use them for new applications. Um, but if you look, for example, at the port of Ocular to Android, um, that's still depending on a lot of those uh, frameworks up there. Um, it's not actively using them, but it's those, they haven't been entirely separated out of the, the core of Ocular. So having them available is enabling uh, Ocular to be on Android already without a um, major refactoring in their code base. So I see those kind of as the porting aids of existing application code to, uh, to Android. Um, then we have a set of frameworks that basically make absolutely no sense at all because they refer to concepts, technologies, or things that, uh, that simply don't exist. So this is um, uh, dbus add-ons, for example, because there's no dbus. Kvalent, because there is no Valent. Um, global accelerators, because there's no keyboard. Um, then um, KAuth and the KDE SU, because there is no concept of a super user, right? So you can't get elevated privileges, so the entire infrastructure for that makes no sense. KDED, that would require a system service. We don't have that. Um, notification configuration UI, that is part of the platform, so we don't need that, um, and so on. Um, and then we have the third set there. Those are the frameworks where I'm not entirely sure yet uh, what we want to do with them. Um, purpose is probably the most interesting thing um, because Android has a very extensive concept of intents, which is very similar to purpose. Um, but purpose is also kind of the implementation of an intent system, not just the abstraction of it. Um, and wallet is a, a similar case, right? So it's the abstraction API for secure password storage, but at the same time, it is the implementation of a secure password storage service. 
Um, so those might need some, some more separation. Um, and I think that is already one of the major challenges we have with, uh, with frameworks. They often mix um, the platform abstraction API and the actual platform implementation. Because on Linux, we need to do the platform implementation and then we have an API on top, right? But on some of the other platforms, um, we might just need the abstraction and then a, a platform-specific backend. Um, another common problem is the, um, the, the mix of core functionality or, or some kind of logic with UI error handling um, specifically based on queue message box, so widget-based error handling. That is something we haven't been doing in, in new APIs since quite a while. But in the older stuff, that still exists. And that then pulls in widget dependencies, for example. I mean, Ike showed this morning that our stack is comparatively lightweight. Um, and I looked at that in, in KDE itinerary. And there we could uh, further reduce the package size by 20% if we would get rid of the unused widget dependency that is just pulled in due to some frameworks depending on it in a way that we can't disable at the moment. Um, so that's another thing where we can uh, make some improvements. Um, and probably most importantly, all of that also is necessary for Plasma Mobile. Right? We don't want to have a queue message box pop up on a Plasma Mobile phone either. Um, and we probably need to have different platform implementations um, like with a file dialog, right? On desktop, that looks completely different than on mobile. So we have the, the same need for separating platform implementation and the abstraction API. Okay, so that is um, basically the, the overview of the current status, I think. Um, and as I mentioned this morning as well, the, if you're getting into this with a with the usual Linux mindset of how stuff is built and how stuff works, um, you will run into a few interesting surprises. And in the following slides, I tried to collect some of the things I ran into and that, um, that cost me much more time than, than it should have to, to understand and to solve. So maybe some of those things are useful for other people looking into um, bringing stuff to Android as well. Um, setup, I'm, I'm not going to uh, go into a lot of detail for that. Uh, Alesh has um, written um, quite a bit about this and documented it in, in the wiki and built the, the whole Docker environment um, that also the binary factory is built uh, around. Um, that's probably the easiest way to, to get um, a setup environment. Um, you will then probably encounter a number of version numbers in, in documentation. You read about that. And there's basically three different version numbers relevant in the Android setup. Um, two of them are the SDK and the NDK version. Those don't really matter. You always want to use the latest one. Um, that has no impact on compatibility. Um, the one that is relevant for compatibility is the API level. And that is uh, fixed to 21 in frameworks, um, which gives us like 99% of the deployment base. Um, for Qt, always try to use the latest version because there is still uh, fixes being added or features being added for very fundamental things like file I.O. Uh, so there is, there is no point in, in staying on something older. Um, Right, and then I mentioned um, platform API is Java, right? So we need to look into how do I call from C++ into Java and how do I call back from, C, uh, from Java into C++. Uh, and the keyword for that is the J uh, Java native interface, or Genie. Um, and uh, the Qt Android Extras module provides us with some, some helper methods and some entry points to actually use that. Um, 
that is actually a quite ugly way to interact because it's uh, heavily string based. I mean, we have an example here. So that's the class you are calling the method pass on, and that is the specification of the signature of that method. Um, so writing that stuff by hand is super error prone, um, and you only get uh, runtime crashes if you have a typo in there. Um, but that's how you apparently call into Java. Um, the other way around is even uh, a bit more complicated. Um, on the Java side, you can declare methods as native and then basically have no implementation, implementation for them. And for those methods to work, you register on the C++ side the method that should be called uh, when the Java side calls into that native method. Um, and that, again, is based on the same um, weird genie signatures that you have to do in a um, specify strings and then register your function pointer and uh, unpack the, the arguments in there. Um, in general, that is probably looking at an example somewhere, copy and pasting it, and trying it a few times until you have fixed all the typos in, in those strings. I mean, there's, there's some really evil tricks in here, like the namespace separator is a slash, while in the Java code you write, it's a dot. So <laughs> just because, yeah. Um, my most common mistake is I write a dot there because that's exactly what I just wrote a minute before in Java, but no, you have to do this with a slash here. Um, there is a prototype in KDE itinerary code that replaces all of that with some C++ code that generates the strings at compile time. Uh, so that's maybe something to look at at the Android BOF if we want to have that globally. Um, but to get started, that is probably the kind of stuff you have to deal with. Um, yeah, then a bit more higher level, um, file access, right? Since we are in a sandbox, the only files you can access like you are used to are the files that live within your sandbox. Um, so your standard path stuff for your personal files, that works. Anything system-wide doesn't. Um, what the, for example, the file dialog gives you for those files system-wide is uh, content URLs. Um, starting with uh, Qt 5.13, you can actually open them with Qt file. Um, and they are essentially a, a local file anyway. Um, but the, due to the isolation, you can't look left and right to them. You can't folder list the parent folder, right? So it's just that one thing that you can access. Um, and while that works with QFile, there is a number of other APIs that deal with files that aren't prepared yet for receiving a URL that should be treated like a local file. Uh, particular, the method is local file that you usually use to separate between I can open this with QFile or I need to go to a network operation um, will claim that's not a local file. Um, and then there's higher level things like QSafe file. I think that we fixed that in 5.13.1, but that was choking on that as well. And there's probably more um, where we'll run into problems with this. Uh, so that's something to be aware of. Um, you get those weird URLs and you need to handle that in code dealing with file names. Um, another concept you will run into, and that would probably fill an entire talk in itself, is the concept of intents. And the closest thing we have to that on, on Linux desktop um, is the mechanism to open files, right? In, on the desktop, you, we have this uh, system that you configure for this file type. Um, uh, Krita is opening that PNG file, right? Um, and then as an application, I just point to the file and say, please open that for viewing or editing. And Intense is a basically a more generalized version of that. 
So you also have an URL pointing to some form of file or object. You have a MIME type, um, and you have an action um, open or edit or share, right? So it's a, a more generalized version of that. Slightly simplified, but... Um, and that's uh, how you interact with a lot of the platform services, including things like um, uh, the file dialogues. Um, assuming you have written that uh, nice genie code and have your, your Java code on the site, um, how do we build that Java part as part of a framework and, and how do we deploy that? And there's basically two systems. One is the jar files. Um, that's what Qt is using. Um, those can be built directly with the uh, Java support in CMake. Um, and then there is the Android archive, or whatever that stands for, IAR files. Um, that's what we are using in, in notifications. Those are a bit more complicated to build because they can only be built with Gradle, which is the Java Android build system. And that has nothing to do with how we are used to build systems. So this is a wrapper for the build system you need to copy in your source code and it then downloads the actual build system, which then downloads 400 megabytes of stuff and then maybe builds something. But that's, how, that's really how it is supposed to be used. Um, so now, when do you pick uh, any of those? Um, the jar thing cannot have any dependencies, and it cannot have any additional APK assets or um, uh, manifest fragments that you might need to ship with it, like give the thing more permissions or uh, set specific settings that Android needs. So for very simple stuff, like the, the typical case in Qt, the jar files are enough. Once you have further Java dependencies, etc., then we need the Android uh, archives. Um, fortunately, you don't have to deal with all this bizarre build system stuff. We have a CMake wrapper currently living in, uh, in the notification repository that actually finds the Gradle stuff in Qt, copies that over in your build directory so you don't have to check that in, and then runs that, and you have to hope that the download servers are available, and then it can actually build something. Um, because in terms of dependencies, one thing you might need is the uh, Android compatibility library so that you can support um, a larger set of uh, Android APIs. Um, Assuming we actually have that built, um, the next step is deployment. And the, um, the keyword for that is the Android Deploy Qt tool. Um, that's what, uh, what generates the APK in the end. And that needs to collect everything that, that you need for your application. Um, and it actually has quite some uh, some heuristics and logic in there to, to determine that. So it looks at library dependencies, basically walking the ELF dependency tree and copy all of that in. It looks at QML imports and imports all the, the QML modules you're using. Um, for non-code assets and QML files for your application, you have to take care of that yourself. Um, so the easiest way to do that is put that in a, in a QRC file uh, and then deployment is easy. Um, if you're working on libraries and you have Java dependencies or other unusual stuff that needs to be included, um, there are the Android dependency XML files that you can put next to the library and that is evaluated by Android Deployer Qt. Um, undocumented format, so copy and paste from some example in Qt. Um, and that's, for example, allows you to specify my library needs those plugins. And yes, I know we are not supposed to use plugins. Um, <laughs> and then those get added as well, um, depending on whether their dependencies are available and so on. Um, 
Yeah, then that's uh, considering the lack of time skipped that for the Android buff. Um, yeah, so as we saw in, in Ike's talk, and um, there is quite some stuff we have to build um, good and useful Android apps, but there is still a lot of work to do uh, to be done to complete the full coverage of all our frameworks, uh, and then to bring more applications to to Android. Um, and with KF6 coming up in the wake of um, Qt6, right, there is a few things that um, we might want to reconsider in the frameworks, um, such as a much stricter separation between platform API or platform abstraction API and platform implementation. Um, there's things like moving the QML bindings to their corresponding modules rather than collecting them in K-declarative, because then by now, K-Declarative has dependencies on stuff that we don't have on Android, so I don't get to the QML bindings, for example, for core add-ons, which perfectly fine work on Android, right? So there might be some, some restructuring, and we need to review the um, widget dependencies. Um, yeah, I think I barely made it in time. Thank you. All right, but we do have time for a couple of questions about Android, Gradle, plugins, K-Declarative, one here. Are you planning to upstream your K-Android extra stuff? I just had a look and the URI handling would be very useful. And there's also Q-Android intent in Qt, which you now rewrote better. Um, are you planning to upstream those things to Qt? Um, Right, what to do with that, I think, uh, would be one topic for the, um, for the Android buff. It might make sense to put that into Qt Android Extras, um, if that is desirable upstream. Uh, it might make sense to have a K Android Extras add-on framework for, for this. Um, the stuff that's in there might not make sense at all, right? So that, this was a, some experimentation to get rid of the uh, this heavy string-based, super error-prone genie thing with something that at least has some basic compile time checking. Um, but yeah, I would I was hoping to get some feedback during during academy on what of this makes sense, how we can improve it, and then where to put it. Yes. The question has already been asked. Anything else? Just one, and then we'll be done. Are you aware of the fact that Java has uh, methods that can be annotated native? That way, you don't necessarily need to do the evil uh, C++ hackery to register methods at runtime, but you can use the Java tooling to generate uh, the right headers for you, and then just implement those. Um, yeah, I've, I've looked at the Java H generator, right? Um, I couldn't get it to produce anything that was, uh, well, not good enough, but was was remotely close to what I was needing. So I probably was using this wrongly. I mean, I'm I'm not an expert in this Java Android stuff, right? I had to look into that to get KDE itinerary to Android. Um, but yeah, that's exactly the the kind of feedback I'm hoping for. So what can we do to to improve this? Um, if there's a way to, to integrate that in the build system properly and, and generate the, the headers, that would be very welcome, yeah. All right, last one. I was asking myself the basically the same question as he was, and I've looked into it, and basically what Android does, it adds a, a tiny layer of abstraction around the GNI stuff, which actually makes it less painful, I think. And I think this kind of abstraction that uh, Qt has doesn't uh, really match the, the Java H stuff anymore from an abstraction level, so in this case it might not be applicable. That wasn't really a question. <laughs> <laughs> Nonetheless, thank you. And thank you, Volker, for another in interesting talk. Um, let's give Volker a hand. <laughs>